Okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, this is the first uh, uh, seminar this year from the International Pacific Halibut Commission, and uh, we're excited to open uh, this uh, seminar series in 2022 with a uh, presentation by Anne-Laure uh, Ferchot from uh, Laval University uh, in uh, Quebec, uh, Canada. Um, uh, Anne Law uh, received her PhD from the University of Montpellier in France, and after uh, several postdocs, uh, she is uh, currently a postdoctoral researcher uh, at uh, Laval University uh, in Quebec, uh, Canada, uh, working in the group of uh, Louis Bernachet. Um, and uh, this group, in fact, has been a leader over the last few years in um, the use of genomic-based uh, methods to uh, inform uh, fisheries management and conservation efforts uh, in a number of uh, freshwater and marine species, uh, and one of which is the uh, Greenland uh, halibut, or also called uh, Greenland turbot. Uh, and um, this is particularly interesting for us uh, at the uh, International Pacific Halibut Commission because uh, they're very related species and they share quite a bit of biology, including habitat. Uh, and uh, we're also pursuing similar questions. So we're really interested in in hearing what uh, Anne Lohr uh, will have to say. Her title of her presentation is High Quality Genomics Towards Improving Fishery Management of Greenland Halibut in the North Atlantic. So uh, go ahead. Um, and Laura. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for giving us the opportunity to talk about this Greenland Alibut project. Um, so as you can see, there is a lot of people in this slide. It's because it's a huge collaborative project actually that has been laid by um oops, sorry. I have is it okay like that? No. I'm not able to switch to, okay. Yeah. No. Uh, so th this project is laid by a researcher team uh, with uh, Céline Audet, Réjean Tremblay, and Pascal Sewa and Louis Benacci at Laval University in Quebec. And this whole project could not have been done with us, uh, the partnership that we have with um, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada who is also Resources Aquatiques Québec uh, from uh, Québec province, Ministère Agriculture, Pêcherie, Alimentation du Québec. We had also some families association and fisheries association, and also the collaboration of Kim Preble from the Arctic University of Norway. And uh, this main project, so the main objective of the overall project was to generate new knowledge in order to maintain the long-term sustainability of Greenland alibut, uh, which is actually one of the main demersal fish uh, species exported by the commercial fisheries in eastern Canada. And I would say after maybe the Atlantic alibut. So by means of the most recent genomic tools, uh, as well as combined with physiological and ecological data, this project was really to uh, generate new scientific knowledge in order to propose a sustainable and responsible management for uh, these species. And today I'm going to focus only on the genomics uh, part. Um, even if there, there were a lot of students involved in physiology and ecological uh, part as well. So why genomics? So, you know that, um, you all know that marine species actually play a fundamental role in meeting the current and future food needs, and they actually correspond to more than 15% um, of the animal protein for more than 4 billion of people. So we need to address the careful management and production uh, strategies uh, to maintain a sustainable future for this uh, seafood industry. But in, in the same time, marine uh, species have some characteristics like long distance, oops, long distance migration, complex life cycle, high fecundity or large populations that makes everything difficult to accurately assess the population structure in marine environments. This is where genomics can be useful and can make a link with fish conservation decision making bringing some new uh, knowledge 
for example, defining management unit, uh, identify hybridization between species, assess the climate change, uh, climate change effects, um, assess the habitat degradation, uh, etc. And this is because um, genomic informed technologies allow for the first time the development and the application of cost-effective genetic tools that can address a lot of needs and applications relevant to uh, fisheries. So I'm going to give you some examples of genomic supply to fisheries management, but I'm guessing that you are already um, kind of convinced of that. And the first example is about the Atlantic Alibut, uh, the Atlantic, uh, sorry, the Atlantic Cod, and has been conducted by Nina Telgidson and uh, her team in 2013, actually. And they have conducted a time series of genomic scan over an 80-year period and in four of a fish population of Atlantic code. And they screen more than 1,000 gene-associated SNPs. So a SNP is like a molecular markers that involves a single change in a base pair. So over these 1,000 gene-associated SNPs, they have found maybe 77 loci that show differentiation across time, across space, or both. And some of them, uh, they actually express some allele frequency shift uh, across time. <clears throat> and they have shown that in some populations, and especially in the first populations that you see, um, this temporal allele frequency shift is correlated with local temperature variations and with also life history uh, changes that has been suggested to be induced by fisheries. And you can note that this temporal shift actually in the first population is occurring uh, between the 20, 1928 and 1960s. And after that, the allele frequency remains stable across time. It's just because the fisheries of Atlantic code have stopped at the time. So here it is, the, the, the first example. And then we have also an example with the Atlantic herring, which is one of the most abundant marine fish in the world, and uh, which is also extraordinary with this species is that uh, it's part of the few species that can reproduce uh, in the very brackish salinity gradient that there is in the Baltic Sea. And previous study, uh, actually based on very few genetics markers, have shown a lack of dif differentiation between geographic regions. And the great majority, so these authors uh, uh, just conducted the genome scan over more than 400,000 SNPs, and they have shown that the great majority of uh, those SNPs show no appreciable differences in allele frequency among populations, like the one you see in the, with the black dots. Uh, but however, there are some of them, like almost 4,000 SNPs, that show striking difference in allele frequency among populations. And some of them, like the blue that is drawn here, is uh, showing, um, is approaching a fixation. And if they pull all, all of those SNPs together, the almost 4,000 SNPs, then they can see that there is a striking uh, um, structuration between the Baltic airing and the Atlantic airing that was not shown by the great majority of the SNPs. And then if we come back with the Atlantic code, um, these authors in 2016, they wanted to explain the divergence between the migratory and stationary ecotypes. And we have so four main ecotypes known for the Atlantic code, and they wanted to explore the genomic uh, divergence involved in these uh, ecological adaptations. And for that, they explore um, more than 8,000 SNPs along the genome, and they have investigated the differentiation between each pairwise comparison, each ecotype pairwise comparison. So we have four ecotypes, meaning that we have three pairwise comparisons. And I will just take time here to describe uh, the in this the FST estimation that they have used because I've also used this FST estimation for the Greenland alibut. So the FST estimation is is just the 
in this of differentiation between two groups, two populations or two groups, and it ranges from zero to one. Zero, the two populations are not uh, differentiated at all, and one, they are maximally uh, differentiated. So you can see that uh, these authors have highlighted actually genomic regions with high differentiations and that were system systematically involved uh, in the difference between the different uh, ecotype pairwise, right? And they have uh, showed that this differentiation in, uh, is mainly driven by three chromosomal rearrangements, so chromosomal inversion mostly, uh, that likely play a role in this ecological adaptation for the Atlantic code. So if we come back to the Greenland alibut, what do we know about this species? Well, this is a species that is part of the pleuronectiform order, uh, as well as the tongsol, the surbolt in Europe or Japanese flounder, is belonging to the pleuronectidae uh, family or the white-eyed flounders, and it is belonging to the hypoglossine subfamily uh, here, as well as its two relative, the Atlantic halibut and Eupacific halibut as well. It has a circumpolar distribution actually, and it's inhabiting the northern part of the Pacific and Atlantic oceans, inhabiting uh, cold and deep water. And historically, there have been two, subs uh, two species uh, described in the genus, one inhabiting the Atlantic part and the other one the Pacific part. Later on, the authors uh, agreed to say, okay, there are not two different species, but two subspecies. And after that, they, uh, they agree, no, it is widely recognized that there is only a single uh, species in this genus, inhabiting the northern part of both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. For both is, uh, its life cycle, so Greenland halibut used to spawn during the winter months. And after that, the, the eggs and the newly, the, the newly uh, acid larvae drift along the upper layers in the, of the water column. And once they get their adult form, the juveniles will settle in shallower waters that they are called nurseries, where they, they are going to feed and to grow up until they get an adult size. So they feed on crustacean, shrimp, uh, redfish, capling, and small uh, other fish. And what is uh, really interesting with this fish is that, is that it's a long migratory, uh, long distance migratory uh, fish, but it has also vertical activity that is known for this fish. So it uses an extensive vertical activity, actually. This fish can use the bottom environment, but as well make use of the pelagic environment for up to one fourth of an individual's lifetime. And you have here an, an example for this vertical activity among um, across months, days, or hours, if you take the, the last one. And uh, between, near, between periods of nearly no vertical activity, you can see that a fish suddenly ascended from about 800 meter depths to cover 250 vertical meters within uh, just one hour. And uh, I think the, the maximum distance cover was like uh, 100 meter within 15 minutes. That, it, that is very fast for such a fish. So, and what about the fisheries? So traditionally, uh, uh, Greenland halibut was fished in northern eastern Canada and Greenland uh, by indigenous people for centuries, um, but uh, it was commercially since the middle of the 19th century. And initially, uh, it was fished using traditional baited wood, hook, and line methods, and nowadays it's more caught by uh, gin nets. For example, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence system, the Greenland halibut fisheries started as a bycatch when uh, fishermen were targeting uh, shrimp and Greenland halibut that were caught incidentally were caved, uh, eaten and sold, leading to an eventually uh, viable activity and that has been developed as a targeted uh, guinnet fisheries in the 1979. And nowadays in Eastern Canada is a very socio-economical 
important uh, industry, actually. So um, Greenland had built a uh, managed based on uh, seven stocks based on the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, as well as the International Council for the Exploitation of the Sea. <clears throat> whereas there is a very limited empirical evidence for those uh, stock definitions. And if we took the example of the Gulf of uh, St. Laurent systems, and we have the, the most recent as assessment for these stocks, we can see that like most of the fisheries in the world, the Greenland halibut fisheries uh, have observed some uh, changes across time, and it is no in located in the caution uh, zone um, since 2017 actually and it has uh, going through a 60 percent decline between 2004 and 2018. What do we know about the genomic uh, perspective for such a species? So we are the recent kind of recent study that has been based on the overall geographical scale for the species so that is really awesome to have this and here you have so that was based on eight macro satellites and you have also a specimen of pacific halibut and captured uh, flounder and we can see that there is no one mixture within uh, between these uh, species and for greenland halibut what we can see from this study is that we have a clear distinction between the Pacific Oceans and the Atlantic uh, Oceans. And what is interesting for us, for our fishery, is what is going um, what is going on on the Atlantic part, and apparently there is no differentiation in this uh, Atlantic part. However, previous uh, study based on non-molecular markers have shown that there is some differences between um, geographically localized populations. Those uh, differences were observed based on morphology, grow rate, fecundity, physiology, or parasitism. Uh, whereas there is also um, some other previous studies that, that have been done using molecular markers, so whether with allozyme, microsatellites, or few SNPs, but they are showing a, a total absence of population structure in the Atlantic. They are even talking about Pamixia. So the situation is not clear and if we focus on this uh, kind of old uh, study that has been done in 1998 I think, uh, so they had samples through the Northwest Atlantic and they tried to um, uh, to elucidate the structuration in there and for that they use a mitochondrial sequences, the cytochrome uh, sequences. And they were just able to say that the Gulf of St. Lawrence was uh, distinct, relatively distinct from the other locality, but nothing was significant, mainly because of the lack of resolution bringing by the cytochrome, the, the mitochondrial sequences. And these authors actually concluded that um, the phenotypic uh, differences observed between uh, geogra geographically localized population likely reflect environmental influences rather than genotypic differences. So we wanted to we wanted to make this uh, clear. So that's why our objective for the genomic uh, Greenland halibut part was to define a fine scale population structure in the Northwest Atlantic along with assessing the putative connectivity between the Canadian and the Greenlandic coast, because this was not known. And um, we wanted also to detect some uh, local adaptation or spatial variation that could explain maybe the phenotypic differences that we were observing uh, between some uh, populations. And we have done that using an old genome resequencing approach. So we wanted to make sure that we are going to capture all the variation along the genome. So for that, we choose to uh, screen all the genomes, but with a low coverage approach. And we had also a second objective, with, which was uh, to estimate the contribution of different uh, stocks to nursery in the central system. And this has been done uh, with a genotyping by sequencing approach, which is also a way to screen all the genomes 
but instead of sequencing everything, we are just cutting it uh, using an enzyme restriction and just sequence the fragments uh, that were cut. And these two approaches actually needed a, a reference genome assembly that we didn't have for the, the, the species, so we made it. And it has been uh, published a couple of months ago. So those who are interested, I would say that all the details uh, might be in the, in the paper. Uh, I will briefly just describe what we have done to get such assembly, but uh, really I won't go into the details. So we simply a female, isolated the high molecular DNA, high molecular weight DNA, uh, <clears throat> use a long read sequencing approach uh, using the pack bio, and then scaffolding uh, scaffolding with the uh, iRISE technology from the doctor IC. So again, I won't detail all the figures in it, but just to say that we got a pretty good assembly that was comparable uh, with the other flatfish species. And you can see that more than 96% of the assembly were covered by the 24 bigger scaffolds that we um, uh, that we were confident to assign like 24 chromosomes actually and we compared those chromosomes with the other chromosomes defined in the assembly uh, that were available for flatfish related species and you can see that we have a pretty good uh, perfect syntonic relationship with your Pacific Alibut assembly actually uh, this is just because we chose the, the Pacific Alibut assembly to name our chromosomes, so that's why it looks so uh, perfect. And then along this uh, assembly, we took the opportunity to investigate the sex determination in uh, Greenland Alibut because nothing was known for the species. So we took a data set of males and females uh, originated from the same geographic regions and we analyzed them by low coverage uh, original movie sequencing. <clears throat> and we tried to investigate uh, where in the genome actually the sex determination could be explained because there is a differentiation between males and females. And we did that using several approaches. And here we just did uh, two of them. So again, uh, there is uh, in the upper part, you have the FST estimation the, so exactly the same estimation that I talk about uh, for the, the Atlantic cod, but here it's not uh, uh, between two populations, it's between males and females. And you can see that uh, we have two mainly chromosomes that are explaining uh, eye differentiation between the two sexes, chromosome 10 and chromosome 21. That might be the sex link chromosomes. And if we look at the heterozygosity, we uh, we can just observe that males experience actually a pronounced heterozygote states at those chromosomes. So this way we just highlighted the uh, XY sex determination system in the Greenland uh, alibut, actually. And if we zoom in these two chromosomes, we have, of course, detected the presence of uh, some uh, genes that have been already known to be in association with the sex determination in vertebrates, in fish, and even in flatfish uh, species. <clears throat> so again, this is uh, very short, but everything uh, is detailed in the, the manuscript, if, if you are interested. So uh, we had a pretty good genome assembly for doing our uh, two approaches that we wanted but we also needed to conduct a very huge effort for the sampling. Um, and we did that actually with the collaboration of uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So we ended up to collect more than 2,000 individuals distributed in three, uh, in uh, 39 localities through uh, the Northwest Atlantic. That, that is huge actually. And the first uh, study that we have done is to estimate the, the contribution of Greenland alibut stocks to nurseries in the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, using the genotyping by sequencing approach. Uh, this has been done by Emily, who was a master student in Louis' lab, and it has been published a couple of years ago. Again, if you want all the details, everything should be in the paper, but you can still ask me. You're very, really welcome to, to do that as well. 
So I will detail the main result of uh, Emily for this part. So she had uh, more than 700 individual samples over the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and we have also two uh, localities that were outside of the Gulf. <clears throat> She had also two nurseries that are the two nurseries that are known to be in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And for each of the nurseries, she sampled uh, 100 juveniles for each year over two consecutive years. And she identified, she defined more than uh, almost 27,000 SNPs, so by uh, genotyping by sequencing approach. And the first thing she did is to identify the different stocks that we had in such a system actually. So, and she did that just running an admixture analysis. It's an analysis to uh, just assign each individual to each uh, cluster genetic, genetic cluster, sorry. And when she did that, uh, taking all the SNPs that she has defined, then we don't see that much information but when sh she removed the sex the sex link markers then we can see that we have two uh, different genetic clusters one formed by the two locality outside of the of the gulf the two nfl localities and one cluster uh, composed for the gulf uh, localities so we um we ended up to say that we have two different stocks, the Gulf and the NFL, the Newfoundland. And then she uh, ran again the same analysis, admixture analysis, to assign each juvenile in each nursery um, to each stock uh, to have an idea about the recruitment. And you can see that for the first year, the recruitment within the St. Lawrence systems depend mainly on the Gulf of the St. Lawrence stocks because we have mainly just purple color, right? But she has done that for the uh, second year. And we can see here in this second year that we have a higher contribution of the Newfoundland stock to uh, the nursery in the Gulf. So there is a temporal variation in it that could be associated to larvae, the special that could depend on current traits or whatever. Um, for the second objectives, for the low coverage or genome resequencing, I have selected uh, 34 localities that correspond to more than 1,300 individuals. And for each of them, we got the all genome resequencing with the low coverage approach again. And each individual sequence has been mapped against our reference uh, genome. And after that, um, I used the pipeline implementing in ANGS, which is a program especially developed for low coverage data. So uh, in this way, I ended up to define more than 5 million of SNP. What I've done with that is that I first, uh, first run a principal component analysis based on those SNPs to see if there is any population structuration in it. You, here you have the first four axes of this PCA, and you can see that there is a clustering uh, on PC1. So if I try to color individuals according to the regions where they are from, where they have been sampled, then you can see that there is kind of distinction of the individuals from the Gulf uh, on PC2 and maybe on PC3 and 4, but this is not explaining uh, what is not happening on PC1. So if I try to color individuals according to the sex identification, then you can see that PC1 is clearly a sex effect. So if I remove again those uh, sex link chromosome, there you see there is a distinction between the individuals from the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the other individuals from the other part of the, um, the Atlantic. Right. What is also interesting to note in this graph in the right cluster is that we don't have any distinction between the Canadian and the Greenlandic coast. This is a result. <clears throat> so after that, um, uh, I did again, I did this uh, FST estimation that I told you about the sex as well. And uh, this FST is estimated pairwise. So I took 
28 localities in my data set. So I ended up to have almost 400 pairwise conversions. And to get right of those results, because it was a lot of results, I simply plot the distribution of those uh, global mean pairwise FST. And I ended up to have a B model distribution. And uh, if I color the pairwise according uh, to the populations they are in there, so if there are two populations uh, within the Atlantic, two populations within the Gulf, or one population in the Atlantic, one population in the Gulf, you can see that pairwise comparisons between Gulf and Atlantic exhibit higher differentiation than locality within the Gulf or within the Atlantic. It's just telling us that uh, there is uh, two different groups. The Gulf is uh, distinct from the other part of the Atlantic, right? So it's concordant with the PCA. But maybe you have seen that the FST uh, value are pretty low. I told you that the FST ranges from zero to one. And here we have a um, differentiation between Gulf and Atlantic around 0 0.008, which is very low. So we can, um, uh, which is also concurrent with what we have on the PC1 uh, axis and on uh, the PCA. We have also less than 1% explained by, by this axis. <clears throat> so it's just telling us that, yes, we have two different genetic clusters in it, but they are not totally isolated. And they might there might be some uh, connectivity between them, there might be some migration. And we also hypothesize that the migration uh, should be higher from the Atlantic to the Gulf than the other way around, especially because of the GBS result that uh, we have observed. Uh, so just remember the contribution of the New Finlands to the Nasseries Gulf. Okay, so um, I, I made this estimation of migration between the two uh, stocks, and for that I was uh, using the joint side frequency spectrum, which is just a way to summarize the information we have um, bringing by two populations. Okay, and then, <clears throat> sorry, and then I use the correlation space simulation uh, implementing in the FASTING code program where I built a model of two populations connected by gene flow. And I did that uh, 100 times, and I re redone the whole process 10 independent times with 10 different bootstrapped uh, side frequency spectrum, just to have accurate estimation parameters and to get interval confidence for them. And <clears throat> I ended up to find that uh, uh, actually, the migration from the Atlantic to the Gulf is effectively higher than the other way around. So, we have two populations that are not isolated from each other. So, now that we know that we have two populations, I wanted to investigate where in the genome is this differentiation happening. So, again, I conducted again this FST estimation but using just those two populations, the Gulf and the Atlantic. And because we had a big data set, it allowed me to, uh, to have two populations of uh, 300 individuals each. That's a lot, and that, that gives me an accurate estimate of FST estimation. So this is the FST estimation along the genome, and as you can expect for a mine species and for two populations that we know are uh, connected, the FST estimation along the genomes are pretty low, <clears throat> around zero. But we have some very restricted genomic regions that are expressing high differentiation between Gulf and the Atlantic. That is very interesting, especially chromosome 3, 5, and the 24 for just putting, putting out the three I just pick. And that could be the sign of local adaptation and uh, or maybe environmental association. I didn't have any uh, phenotypic uh, data to compare with. That would have been super interesting, but it's difficult to have. But rather, I was able to collect some uh, environmental data in each locality. And here, I have quickly built a habitat score composite using the temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. 
and you can see that there is a kind of a different environmental patterns happening in the Gulf uh, compared with uh, the other part of the Atlantic. So I have investigated this environmental association just looking at the relationship between my alert frequency and uh, different environmental variables that I took both at the bottom but also at the surface of the sea because we have seen that the Greenland halibut uh, has a vertical activity and can use the pelagic environment as well. <clears throat> so I've done that using two different approaches, a redundancy analysis and a, a latent factor mix model analysis. I won't go into the details for that but just briefly, so over the 14 environmental variables that I have detect, that I have tested, uh, the redundancy analysis indicate me that seven of them turn to be uh, significant. So they significantly explain the variation, the genetic variation I observe in my data set. That is to say, um, two variables at the bottom. So we observed significant uh, for the dissolved oxygen temperature as well and temperature is also significant at the surface layer. Uh, we have also the nitrate salinity and two variables of productivity uh, chlorophyll and phytoplankton and for each of those variables we have a certain number of outliers uh, that were defined and uh, I compare that with the LFMM approach and here you can see that um, the, the variables, so all the variables, I was not able, for with the LFMM approach, I'm not able to say that a variable is significantly or not associated with the allele frequency. I'm just t testing all of the SNP and I just predict if uh, it is an outlier or not. So what I can see from this analysis is that uh, variables that turn to be significant with the RDA as significantly higher number of outliers that uh, variables that were not significant with RDA, right? So I just um, so so from that I just decided to focus only on environmental uh, variables that were significant with RDA. Here you have the distribution, the genome-wide distribution of those outliers. Uh, for each of the variables. So that is maybe a lot to interpret, but you can see and the different colors correspond to different uh, false discovery rate to each outliers. And you can see that there are some uh, genomic regions with odd spot of uh, outliers. And what I wanted to see if, is that um, is this high spot of uh, genomic regions of uh, outliers, how they correlated with the genome-wide differentiations that we observe between the Gulf and the Atlantic. So here again, I plot the FST estimation that you have already seen uh, between the Gulf and the Atlantic, and I just mirror those FST value for the common outliers between my two approaches. So the outliers that I, um, I kept in my analysis. And effectively, we can see that environmental condition uh, explain high differentiation between the Gulf and the Atlantic, but also some low regions, uh, so some regions with low differentiation are also uh, explained by environmental association. And yeah, I will skip this slide because we don't need it. Uh, and of course, we have uh, look for some gene association in those regions and in chromosome 3 for example which is the highest peak uh, of differentiation we have uh, found the green sensitive opsin genes that is uh, in these regions and that is known to be in association uh, with somatic growth in the bath in Flander, for example, so which is really interesting. In chromosome 5, we have uh, the guanine nucleotide exchange factor B, which is involved in uh, development and gastrulation. And in chromosome 23, just to cite the three um, first IOS peak, we have a genes that is involved in response to oxidative stress. <clears throat> so if I try to sum up, everything I've said about this uh, genomic Greenland halibut project. So we have built the high quality uh, genome assembly. 
which could be really useful just for this species, but also for the related species, of, of course. Along that, we have uh, identified a genetic sex determinism, and uh, which will be a high contribution to the genomic resources for the important flatfish aquaculture, and especially because we know that in Greenland halibut there is a sexual uh, dimorphism and a difference in grow rate. Uh, this work has been done by Leo Paul, who was actually the PhD student involved in the physiological part of the project. Um, after that, we have also highlighted the importance of the sex and time in order to identify the accurate uh, structuration and recruitment in marine populations. I would say that it's really, really, really important for marine populations. So uh, if you have uh, the sex information, then take it and remove it if you want to see any a signal of geography or whatever. Uh, then we have successfully identified the Gulf of St. Lawrence as a distinct stock from the rest of the Atlantic. And we think that it's mainly autosufficient, but uh, we have shown that it's totally not isolated from the rest of the Atlantic, especially showing uh, this asymmetric uh, migration rate between the two. And according to the conclusion of a uh, recent collaborator in uh, 98, where they talk about, uh, okay, the phenotypic uh, differences observed between populations uh, should reflect environmental influences rather than genotypic differences. Yes, of course, they uh, represent, and we think that they represent uh, environmental condition, um, and they are expressing up to the genomic level, actually, we have seen that, and we have seen an effect of temperature, the dissolved oxygen, the salinity, productivity, and nitrate. And um, we have been able to detect that because we have conducted an whole genome resequencing approach, and we have also, we had the opportunity to have a huge sampling effort throughout the Northwest Atlantic. So we thought that it won't have been possible to uh, show such a, an effect on the environment um, to the genomic part. And if I came back to these environmental conclusions that uh, we have observed, everything, everything is in concordance with uh, what is known in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and what is actually pointing out in, even in the media, because we know that everything is warming, uh, even the depth layer, uh, the depth water is very warm and warmer and, uh, in the Gulf. And you can see that it's not going to be better in the future, so it's going to be uh, warmer and salty, even at the depth layer, I say. So in the last uh, 12 years, we have an increase of 1.5% in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And who say warm and salty water say that there is less and less uh, dissolved oxygen available in the water, and this is also observed that we have less and less uh, dissolve oxygen across time, as you can see in, uh, in the Gulf system. And if you have uh, less oxygen, then uh, the production of nitrate is just increasing. <clears throat> that is also observed uh, in the last uh, three years. And we have also an impact on the productivity uh, system as well. Here you have the clarified data across the three last year. Also, we know that and this is really not good news. Uh, we know that exposure to nitrate increases susceptibility to hypoxia in fish. And we also know that uh, there is an impact of hypoxia on the metabolism of the Greenland halibut. Uh, especially, we know that juveniles are less tolerant to hypoxia than adults because of the increasing of duration of uh, digestion process. So, Everything has an impact, and this is not really good. And <clears throat> we have already an impact, uh, as you can see, because we know that we have a decrease in abundance and biomass uh, here with fish above 40 uh, centimeters. So, in conclusions, we know that Greenland halibut is tightly, uh, tightly linked to its environment. And uh, we have shown in the, with these studies that uh, it has some uh, genomic footprints in it. 
And I would add that there are two main considerations to take um, for these fisheries is the first, the comeback of the red fish, uh, which is a direct competitor of Greenland halibut. And uh, the upcoming reopening commercially fisheries for these species will increase Greenland halibut caught as bycatch for, for sure. And there is also a decline in the northern shrimp, uh, which is uh, a prey for the Greenland halibut. So that is also uh, concerning, I would say. So based on that, I just want to uh, thank again all the partners and all the people uh, that have been uh, involved in this project and all the people in, uh, in the Banachi Labs and you for your attention. Thank you. And I, I would be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anne-Laure. Um, we uh, failed to mention at the beginning of the introduction that the uh, questions uh, would be uh, read. Uh, so please type your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, there was a message there. Uh, your Your chat should be on the bottom uh, right uh, of your screen uh, below attendees and below questions. So uh, please uh, start typing them there. Um, in the meantime, while we wait for questions to show up, um, I may break the ice and, and ask a couple of questions. So th that was a really interesting presentation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Anne Laura. Um, Particularly interesting was the, the the last portion of your presentation with the um, link um, uh, between the uh, genomic uh, differentiation and the environmental parameters. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and you showed that there were a number of outliers that uh, could be, um, you know, associated with with different environmental parameters. Uh, uh, and, and you mentioned um, a few examples of those uh, genes that could be potentially uh, yeah. responsible for that. Um, obviously, just mention one per each uh, a chromosome, but I'm sure there's obviously there's more outliers. Uh, uh, and the ones that you mentioned were probably the ones with the highest FSTs. But um, did you did you take a closer look at other uh, uh, other outliers to see if you could actually uh, find, uh, you know, further support for, uh, um, you know, adaptations at the gene expression level. Uh, so yeah. that would be one question, and the, and then the the following one would be, uh, did you guys have tissues to look at the gene expression differences for those particular outliers and and by 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 uh, qPCR, for instance? Um, so I will answer the second questions right away. Uh, we do not have tissues to look uh, to look at that. That would have been uh, super, but we do not have uh, any tissue. So uh, that's very difficult. And for your first questions, yes, actually that's a very good question. And I'm always the first to say, okay, but uh, there is not only a single gene in this part. So. Um, here for the presentation, I decided just to choose one of them, and that makes sense also with the environmental associations that we found in this era. So obviously, yes, there is several genes, and that could have also uh, another impact for the local adaptation. Uh, but I have also to say that those genomic regions that I pointed out, uh, they are very uh, restricted and narrow. For example, the one. So I don't have the the numbers in in mind right now. But uh, the the one in chromosome three, I think it's uh, it's less than ten thousand base pairs. So it, there is not so many genes uh, genes in there. You see. Okay. All right, thanks, Angler. Uh, we have a couple of questions already. Um, the first one is uh, by Ingrid Spies. Uh, great talk. Uh, sorry, I joined late. I was wondering if you included any Greenland halibut from the Pacific uh, in your data set. No, actually, no. Unfortunately, we didn't have any. Okay. Uh, second question. This one is from Steve uh, Latham. Uh, the question is, would you have 
found any additional insights by analyzing the sexes separately rather than excluding sex-linked loci for your population substructure investigation? Um, no, I don't think so because uh, there was like pretty good uh, sex ratio in our population except maybe one or two in the Gulf that were composed mainly by females. But the point is, is that we wanted to uh, to have an idea about the geographical structuration. So because the sex differentiation is so strong, we have to remove those sex link regions to see other things than sex differentiation. I am answering correctly to the question, so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Ingrid uh, had a comment uh, from your response. She said, she yeah. said uh, contact me if you would like some. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so far, I don't see any more, but uh, I do still have a few um, that I would like to. I was very curious about, uh, the, in your introduction, the a little bit of the history of how the two subpopulations, the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, um, uh, uh, what's the current status of that, and 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 it and uh, you laid it out pretty clearly that it's 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 just one species. Yeah. Um, but is there any idea when those two subpopulations, if you want to call them that way, um, uh, were separated? No, to be honest, I have no idea when and why exactly. No. <laughs> I mean, originally it was just one population and then they got separated. Um, yeah. Uh, has there been any effort to um, uh, look at those two populations, North Pacific versus North Atlantic for Greenland halibut? Uh, you mean at the genomic level? Yes. I don't know. I don't think, no, I don't think so. I don't, not from my knowledge, I think. But uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, uh, we have another question. This is from uh, Kristen Hayward. Uh, is sex bias dispersal a consideration in these populations or stocks? Uh, that's a good question. I don't. Um, I don't think so. I would say I don't think so. But uh, um, actually. We have a student that was more focused on the ecology, ecological part and that focused on the autolite chemistry, um, more on the juveniles, but I think he has explored uh, the literature of that and I'm not pretty sure, but uh, they, are, they are known to, to be like a very long distance migration fish and they can just encompass thousands of kilometers, but I'm not sure about the sex uh, difference, and uh, I don't think that there is any sex dispersion in there. But I, I won't know how to answer correctly to these questions. That's a good question. Okay. Um, I don't see any more coming up. Um, I may take the opportunity and ask you another one. And that goes back to uh, your interesting data on the environmental parameters. Did you see any particular association, genomic association with with individual um, uh, environmental parameters, particularly in the Gulf of St. Lawrence? With what? With, with, with specific um, environmental parameters, for instance, um, you know, like uh, bottom oxygen, uh, or temperature gene, genes that would be associated or linked with with specific uh, environmental variables. Oh, actually, uh, most of them that I've presented are unique to um, to one variable that I've tested. So I have at the end I have seven environmental variables that I consider, but most of the outliers are unique to one single uh, variable. Some of them and very few of them are shared between uh, between uh, outliers. But just to maybe I can show you, and uh, yeah, this is the LFMM outliers. Um, uh, 
can see except except from this uh, very hot spot of outliers on chromosome 3 and 23 that there might be some regions that are specific to one uh, environmental variables but it's not very clear is that answering your question yeah, yeah that's that's very interesting yeah thank you well uh, i don't see any other uh comments um i think we're going to bring this to a close it's almost uh, uh the hour um so thanks again very much uh, and laura for your really interesting presentation uh, we look forward to seeing that uh, study uh, uh, publication form, uh, the environmental mm -hmm. association one. And, um, and again, thank you very much. Uh, that was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.